life living and making a living can sometimes wear you out, grind you down, and dull your senses. So for a keen mind and a sharp contributive edge that will give you a better chance of success and happiness, take this time out to sharpen your axe. Stay with us right now for Life Talk. Hello, I'm Gina Fitt, and you've either surfed to or purposely selected Life Talk with Bern Moses. Welcome to another in our series of ongoing verbal essays brought to you in this television format. We're delighted to have you with us today. Bern, it seems to me like last week we were talking about the criteria for success. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be great for our audience if we could have a quick review and then proceed from there and cover the rest of the points. Yeah, we had uh, determined that... Uh over the last oh, 20, 30 years, we've gradually narrowed this thing down to just a few criteria. And uh, we had mentioned that certainly time consciousness would have to be one of them. And this was in place of time management or utilizing time appropriately. But it's becoming conscious of it and predeterminately designing a day so that we could maximize and how it extends the day and gave us more time, which certainly is valuable to the independent contractor, the salesperson, the business person. Uh, we talked about making priority lists, and I suggested possibly that rather than A, B, C, D, we also include things we must do today, and oftentimes they're the things we don't want to do, or the things that aren't the most pleasant things, but they're the, there are the must-dos. And we know that if we do those first, we buy our spirit, we buy our time, we buy our joy. Uh, I know, for example, uh, every day you should start out with making a phone call to someone you don't want to talk to. <laughs> because if you don't want to talk to them all day long, they're on your mind. Yeah. You know, if you can do it first way, it's out of the way. Then there's things that you should do and things you'd like to do. And uh, it's surprising how much free time we can have if we do it that way. It's kind of fun. Then we talked about integrity uh, in addition to, not instead of, but in addition to um, honesty, authenticity, candor. Uh, and talked about structure and flexibility. Uh, this was another form of integrity that we have to have in business and in sales and frankly in all of our communications. I mean, now it's hard to have structure and the attending flexibility without a sense of purpose for our life. You know, all these things blend together in such a way that all of these shows that we've done during the past year, if somehow you could kind of just shuffle them, collate them into the mind of someone, all of this would make more sense. But you know, if you're on purpose, that gives you a structure for your life. Parameters and principles are established that you don't want to violate. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, and yet within that, you have the flexibility of a broad range of possibilities. Uh, adoptability, we talked about. Uh, that capacity to adopt people genuinely yeah. and therefore to be adoptable. It, it seems to me that going back to integrity for a moment and maybe as that also relates to adoptability that integrity in our relationships is the most essential thing to create happiness mm -hmm. and peace in our lives and I think that does mean choosing to do what's in concert with your value system, mm -hmm. regardless mm -hmm. of how the other people in the relationship or relationships with you may choose to respond. Right. No, and no matter how they are upset or angry or frustrated or whatever, you don't have to respond in kind. Mm -hmm. You can, res and having the structural integrity of who you are, what you want, what you believe, and what you think is appropriate behavior can always govern your mm -hmm. actions and make such a difference in the power you have. Yes, it's kind of remember in, um, in Life Formula we talked about one of the facets of love is guilelessness yeah. without any guile at all yeah. and that takes courage right. to be open and authentic, transparent if you would and yes, that's where huge amounts of love exist and whenever you're in the love mode that's where your power is over yourselves. There's, there's tremendous, so, I think, tremendous strength that comes from consciously choosing mm -hmm instead of reacting. And we talked oh, about that, the goodness, reacting yeah. versus the responding. And I think that's where the flexibility comes in. Mm -hmm. If you have predetermined what appropriate behaviors are for most circumstances, or at least determined what behaviors are not appropriate under any circumstances, you have a flexibility of choices that you can pick. Predetermination from, is a nice word from, in there too, right. isn't it? Because if Absolutely. you can decide well in advance what you're going to say, what you're going to do when something comes up, when it does, you're much more in command. You, you have that, yeah. like that script that you were talking yep. about last week. Yep. You can't wing it. 
Right. You're going to do what comes naturally. You lose <laughs> because agree. we're supernatural Absolutely. beings. And uh, yeah. And I think that translates into how adoptable you are mm -hmm. to others, and also your ability to adopt them in spite of whether they are inappropriate or not. Exactly. Good. Good. Good point. Um, let's go to presentations for a minute. You know, obviously, I'm often talking to salespeople, and I don't really care to get into uh, the material presentations. I mean, it should go without saying that they shouldn't be coffee, coffee stained and dog eared, you know. Uh, the ones that I like to spend my time with are, are the value of scripting um, and uh, presentation, actual physical presentation of ourselves. Uh, for a moment, let's talk about scripting. Uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, no, I, uh, I, I think that's phony. Okay, I, I don't want a script. Um, and I think we have to be careful of that because life, when it really works well, is, is done by script. For example, mm -hmm. thank you is a script. And it doesn't matter who says it or how they say it, it seems to work pretty well. Yeah. Like a little two-year-old says, thank you, Grandma, and Grandmother thinks he's just wonderful. And we rehearse you know I mean? those lines over and over again, <laughs> exactly. and our parents beat them into us. Exactly. Yeah. And it's kind of like, uh, well, there's so many, but, you know, who would mess with the Lord's Prayer or the preamble to the Constitution or, for that matter, Hamlet? You know I mean, those are mm -hmm. scripts. And you can just imagine how an actor would fare if he said to the director in Hamlet, that doesn't feel comfortable for me. I'd rather say it this way. Yeah. You know, good luck. Right. We'll get another actor here. And uh, I think more of us are more scripted than we are, than we are prepared to admit. But in some professions, it demands a great deal of it. Certainly in show business, but certainly in show business. And selling is show business. And the fact that you're showing uh, a product or a service constantly. And it has to be done with structure and script. Because some words just say it better than others. There's well, no question. Well, every one of us are going to be selling something even if it's ourselves, mm -hmm. at one time or another. That's like an interview. If you're Absolutely. not scripted, you can make all kinds of Absolutely. mistakes. Or your first date. Oh my, yes. Or uh, I think even teaching your children. Mm -hmm. And so often people, I, I don't know how to t talk to my children in this circumstance. I don't know how to teach them what I need to teach them. Mm -hmm. And they wing it. Yes. And I think absolutely if we would sit down beforehand and determine, outline what it is we want to accomplish, how we're going to say it, and review our options, mm -hmm. we can be so much more effective. Committed with a lot more power, yes. a lot more authority. That's good. Um, I'll tell you some classic examples of scripting. Uh, you know, there's people who argue against it and what have you, and I, I sympathize because it takes a lot of work sometimes, a lot of application, a lot of practice to really confine yourself to a script. Uh, but every time this comes up, I think of a circumstance. I don't think I've ever talked about it on the show was one of the most astounding evenings of entertainment I've ever had in my life. Did I talk about that when we were... I don't were... believe so. Anyway, uh, it was in 19, had to have been 1953. Uh, I believe it was 53. I had an occasion to see Judy Garland on Broadway, on 42nd Street, off Broadway. And uh, it was astounding. And you know, I never really cared for Judy Garland too much, you know, in the movies. Mm -hmm. But that evening, on stage, was the most awesome thing I'd ever seen. Really? Oh, yeah. The chemistry, the charisma, the dynamics of her were just unbelievable. And I remember that so well because I was there with two or three of my friends, and, and we'd enjoyed the show. And at the end of it, one of the last songs she sang was A Star is Born. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, you could tell she was tired. Uh, she was already having a drug problem, but we loved her anyway because of the, their performance that evening. But anyway, she was tired, forlorn, worn. And you could see that was it. And she left the stage, and the crowd stood and roared. I mean, applauded and, you know, debate for more and more. And it was, like, embarrassing, you know what I mean, to be part of that. <laughs> uh -huh. And yet I wanted to see more, too. And finally she came out across the stage, and she came and she sat right at the edge of the stage, dangled her legs over the edge of it, nodded to the orchestra, because what they really wanted to hear was what? Somewhere over the yeah, rainbow. Yeah, somewhere over the rainbow. Right. Thank you. You just nailed it. And uh, she nodded to the orchestra. They started playing, and she started singing. And I think probably about 12 bars into it, uh, the tears were rolling down her cheeks, and it was awesome. And she finished it, and she got up, and the crowd was going crazy. And she left, and you knew somehow she wasn't coming back, no matter how much we appealed. And that's the way it happened. Well, we left there, I mean, just, you know, fulfilled totally. In 19, uh, had to have been 
63, I believe it was. I was in uh, Tucson, Arizona, staying with a friend. And I think it was Johnny Carson's show. And um, the, uh, the guest was Mel Torme. And Mel was a very, very dear friend of Judy Garland's. And they'd never had an intimacy or anything, but just dear friends. And uh, he began to talk about this performance that she did on you know, 42nd Street off Broadway. And he was talking about how you know, she was tired and forlorn and sang A Star Is Born. And she left the stage and the crowd demanded that she come back. And she did and sat at the end of the stage and uh, dangled her legs over the edge and yeah. nodded to the orchestra because the crowd wanted to hear. And she did indeed sing Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And about 12 bars in, he said, the tears rolled down her cheeks, and we were totally captivated by this. Well, I mean, I couldn't believe he was talking about it. I mean, it was that evening. You're you know? I were there. I yeah. was there, yeah. And anyway, I couldn't go backstage like he did. And he went on to tell the story about how he went backstage and to visit with her. And I uh, said, this is incredible. You know, and was talking about how he wanted to bring some friends back. And she said, well, send your friends if you like, but please don't come back to see the show. Just don't. And uh, he dishonored that. You know, he did come back uh, several days later, brought friends, and sat there, and he said it was unbelievable. She just wowed him. And finally came to that point where she sang A Star Is Born, and obviously tired and forlorn, and, you know, and they loved it and demanded that she come back because they wanted to hear Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And so she did, and she sat at the edge of the stage and put her legs over the edge and nodded to the orchestra, 12 bars in, what? Tears rolled down her cheeks. You understand what I'm saying? She gave everybody that show. See, that's script. That's professionalism. I mean, just awesome when you think about it. Everybody got her best. Uh -huh. And I think this is the way it should be uh, on a presentation. I mean, every prospect deserves our best for them if indeed we're proud of our product and believe that it can make a difference in someone's life or indeed make their job easier or more productive or more profitable. I mean, we have a responsibility to do that as well as possible, and the only way you can do it is with script, okay? Now, the other means of presentation. I don't know how much time we have, but this is worth discussing. Um, clothes, okay? <laughs> this is pretty fascinating. It was about 12 years ago. I paid $1,200 to go see Ponte. Uh, it was a seminar in Los Angeles, California. Have you ever heard of Ponte? No, He's I an international clothing consultant. Okay. And this guy is, you know, and, and in relationship to Malloy, who wrote Dress for Success, mm -hmm. Malloy was a radical, okay, a real liberal when it comes to Ponte. And Ponte in the seminar said, rather than my tell you what you should be wearing, because I could be prejudiced, okay, and as I had my own taste, my own flair, he said, we're going to do it another way. And I sat there and I watched something that influenced how, what I wear and how I wear it for the rest of my life. Really? Yeah, let me tell you. Uh, there was a platform there, and uh, there was a curtain, and he had uh, male models, first of all, come and stand behind the platform. You couldn't see them. You could see like a shadow back there. And uh, there was, by the way, nearly 200 people in the room, okay, mm -hmm. and uh, from all over the country, uh, different age groups, different socioeconomic backgrounds and what have you. But they sat there, and they, he raised the curtain. He said, all right, now just look at the shoes. I want you to tell me which pair of shoes, A, B, C, D, E, or F, there were six of them, which pair of shoes you want on your salesman? Which pair of shoes do you want on your corporate executive, on your middle management executive? Which pair of shoes do you want if you're going out dancing? Which pair of your shoes do you, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because he had these different things. And Gina, it was 100% agreement. Everyone had the same opinion yeah. about what was appropriate. Well, everyone had the same uh, d idea as to what was appropriate in each one of those cases. How interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's irrational. And you say, that's what happened. Okay, when given the choice, they all chose the same thing for each of those events. Okay, then he raised the curtain more, and he showed just cuffs of trousers. He said, all right, what cuff do you want? Okay, and what I'm going to talk about is the dress that was selected for salespeople. Okay? People who are going out to persuade, uh, to attempt to communicate in order to dissuade someone or actually persuade someone to surrender their hard-earned money in exchange for product or service. Okay? Okay. And this is what he was saying. And we're going to talk about men first, and then we'll go to the women. Oh, this is really fascinating. Yeah. I'm okay. interested. Okay. The shoes on the salesperson was thin-soled. 
thin sole, plain toe, black lace. A very conservative shoe. He said that a thick sole implies the need for money. And I've even had people say that. You know, if I'm going to be walking around a lot, I'm going to get a good thick sole. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. He said, no. Thin soles mean money, and people give money to people who don't need it. Okay, they're more likely to surrender it to someone that, if they think the money's going to get to where it's supposed to be. They, I guess they trust that they'll pass yes. it on, or they're yes, not gonna... exactly. It's a, it's a subliminal Isn't thing. That interesting. It's not a conscious thing, but it's subliminal. But a thin sole, black lace, okay, plain toe shoe. All right. Um, now the second choice in shoe was cordovan. That was you know that, that okay. burgundy look. Uh, yeah, burgundy yeah. brown. That was okay, but it was second. Mm -hmm. Brown was way down the list. White wasn't even you know you no don't, way. No yeah, way. you can't yeah. do that. Okay, so we have the shoe. Then the hose had to match the shoe. Mm -hmm. See, I've been to haberdashers recently. I mean, shopping, and and I've been told that you should try to match your trouser, and you shouldn't. You the hose should the match shoe. the shoe, exactly, because it gives a plain, fixed line right up, you know. So the black kind of, sock, black shoe. Right, and a, and a, and a cordovan shoe, a burgundy sock. Mm -hmm. No designs, no patterns. None you know, of that. None of that. That's right? too flashy. Exactly. It's presumptuous. Yes, and over the calf is essential. They don't want to see shiny shins, hairy legs, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, over the calf is important. Now, it's kind of interesting because I've taken young men, even middle-aged men out to buy that pair of shoes, and they were resistant. You know, they thought, oh, it's an old man's shoe and this kind of thing. But once they had the shoe on, I mean, I would watch them walking around admiring their shoes for days. And they liked it. Yeah. They felt it just worked. appropriate. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Now, no cuff on the trousers. They didn't want a cuff because a cuff is distracting and it implies storage space. You know, if you turn a cuff down, Gina, typically it's going to have ashes and dust and, you know, mm -hmm. you know stuff in there. Yeah. But they didn't want a cuff. It should be plain. And it's a little too sporty. It costs mm -hmm. too much attention to, exactly. to yourself. Exactly. Now, this has nothing to do with fat or fashion. Mm -hmm. I mean, this mm -hmm. has to do with presentation. Right. Okay, getting the job done. What, okay. kind of what kind of a person are you who would wear these clothes? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, the material it should be a suit. You know, sports clothes are not appropriate if you're trying to persuade okay, and get money. All right? Should be a suit, should be a uh, natural fiber, and those wool, okay? Hard finish, you know, smooth, hard finish. Um, no, uh, no continental trousers, they want a belt, okay? And the belt should match the shoes. Mm -hmm. If you've got a black leather shoe, black leather belt. Mm -hmm. The belt should have a minimum amount of metal on it, if any. If you get a covered belt, so much the better, because that disappears, okay, better. Um, the suit should be navy blue, well not navy blue, blue suit, a blue suit, but then you got to be careful because blue, all blues have undertones to them, mm -hmm. either gold or, um, or blue undertones. Mm -hmm. And so you got to be careful of your complexion that you get the right blue. Mm -hmm. and, Warm uh, or cool. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can really, and if you get the right one, it, it just comes together and if you have the wrong blue, it looks like your head is sitting on top of the suit. I mean, it separates somehow, the eye. But it should be a compatible blue. Second choice is gray. Mm -hmm. Second choice is gray. Uh, brown is down the list. Black is not on the list for sales. For sales. It's too ominous, yeah. too powerful, okay? Authority figure. Yeah, mm -hmm. too authoritative, too powerful. Uh, but b brown is way down the list. It really shouldn't be on the sales list at all. And green, uh, you'd be surprised how many green suits there are out here in the world, should not be worn. Mm -hmm. Okay, just that's an absolute no. Double-breasted suits are always appropriate, always in. That's kind of fascinating to me, especially if your person is chunky, kind of heavy, mm -hmm. because there's more material to cover, mm -hmm. okay, the body, if mm -hmm. it's unbuttoned and what have you. And so a double-breasted blue um, is the most appropriate. Mm -hmm. Single-breasted is okay if you're real slender, but if you carry any weight at all, it should be a double-breasted suit. Um, okay, white long sleeve shirts. Now, not sure no, oh, no, long. Not even in the summer. Well, he said the only person or salesperson that should wear a short sleeve white shirt is a salesman calling on a manufacturer of what? Short sleeve short -sleeve white shirt. Short sleeve white shirt. Then you might get away with it. But even then, yes, it's questionable. No, long, no, it's long uh, sleeve white shirts buttoned. What about pinstripes? No, no. Colors? No, 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 stay with white. Now, Malloy allowed for pinstripe, grays, blues, this kind of thing. Malloy says, don't you touch it. Don't mess with it. It's long sleeve white shirt. Um, 
no button downs. Those are not supposed to be buttoned down. Because if you've ever watched button down shirts, they'll curl and do all kinds of crazy stuff if you're not careful. Mm. But a solid collar, uh, no tabs underneath there, okay? Um, uh, standard cuff, no cuff links except after five. And if you take something out to dinner, it's okay to wear a cuff link. But that's an, not that's for an work. evening, not it's for too work. Fancy. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. No, nothing in this pocket. Mm -hmm. Nothing in this pocket. And if you haven't tailor made, there'd be no pocket. You know, there wouldn't even be there something to distract. But nothing in the pocket because it tends to pull the eye. What about initials? No, oh no. No initials. Well, you can have a monogram, sure, but the monogram should be six inches above the cuff. Oh, really? Yeah, it should be up in here. So the only people who know that you have a monogram is your tailor and your, your laundry guy. You know, maybe your spouse or something. Or if you happen to take off your jacket, but a, a monogram should be six inches above the cuff. That's interesting. Yeah. They, um, okay, um, let's see, ties. You get a little chance for flair, except for one thing. You've often heard that, you know, ties will come back in style again, so you can keep them. No, you can't. Because when they come back, like the wide tie will come back, but it'll be a different material. Different colors. Different colors. Different patterns. Yeah, so you can't beat the fashionist there. Um, oh, if there's a pocket, and there usually is in a suit, it must have a white hanky in it. Really? Yeah, it's it not must. supposed to match the tie. Yeah, it's supposed to be a white hanky. It should look like one. It should be a puff or a square, and it could be used. No, even though it's not, it, there's a it sense that it could, like it could be used. Exactly. What if you don't have a hanky at all? Is that acceptable? No. No. You, there should be something in that should pocket. Be something. Something in that That's pocket. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, a they lot were, of people, people don't real, wear hankies. Oh, I know. I know. And it, it has an impression of formality, and yet it completes the look when you see it. Because mm -hmm. you can have a whole row of people, and all of them won't have a hanky, and one guy does, and that's where the eye will go. He's and the they, one who stands out. Yeah, he's the one who's dressed, yeah. That's the thing. Um, I was trying to think what else was. Uh, this is primarily for men. Uh, oh, no more, no more than three pieces of jewelry, okay? On men or women, by the way. Mm -hmm. No more than three pieces. Uh, earrings are one on a woman. Mm -hmm. That's just be one, and a wedding ring and a watch would be all you should wear. Um, I take a chance with a logo ring, but I can use this in presentation, so mm -hmm. it's probably okay. No pinky rings, and no, no. forefinger rings, right. and no thumb rings. Okay, those things are too distracting, and they upset people. Um, three pieces of jewelry. Let's see if there's anything else here. Uh, that's probably a pretty good cover of men. I don't think I've overlooked anything. Oh, no tie tacks, no lapel pins. They had a machine there. It was similar to the thing I saw one time in the Navy where you could watch the eye pattern of a reader go back over. Well, they had this machine there that would actually chart out eye movement, and they would have someone sit in front of someone with a tie tack and a lapel pin, and what would happen, the eye would leave the, the person's face and go to that tie tack and lapel pin. Back and forth. Back, back and forth. forth, busy looking at all the distractions. And he says, what that is, is a subconscious mind trying to escape. No, it'll take anything. This is, remember we talked one time about our set here as yes. no distractions? Right. So that people have to kind of listen to what's going on rather than trying to figure out what's on those books in the background. <laughs> or, or those are pretty flowers. Is that a real tree or yeah. not? Yeah. yeah. It has nothing to do with anything. So. But that's essentially what that's about. The idea of the clothes is that the clothes should disappear after the first few m moments which you're together. Because they notice the presentation and then that disappears and all they see is the face and hands. Okay, now that's what we're up to, is that's how you communicate, is with face and hands, not with your suit. Mm -hmm. and you don't want to wear anything that's distracting. One of the most successful people I've ever known uh, was a guy named Mr. Pollock. I think his wife called him Mr. Pollock in all the moments of their life. But anyway. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he was a billionaire, and uh, he had one outfit that he wore all the time. It was the same suit, same shirt, same tie, same shoes, every single day of his profession. And, of course, he had a closet full of them. Okay, they were just all But they were the all same. exactly the same. And when you think about it, what he, what he was right about was that when he went in to do business, there was no consideration process. He was there to do business. The mind was not toiling over, you know, how he looks good today. I wonder where he got that suit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That wasn't even present. He was there and he was ready. And it saved a lot of time and a lot of emotional energy and distraction. And it makes sense when you think about it. I think it also provided a sense of stability and security. Oh, no question. You could always depend on him. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Um, it has nothing to do with taste, and it doesn't, it's not a matter of how your wife, you know, thinks you're, what, what you're cute in or anything. It's about what this is, you know, the idea of disappearing. 
Uh, I don't know that we have enough time to cover women, but we're going to start. Um, let's see, I was trying to think. Um, high heels, of course, uh, appropriate. Oh, no anklets. The shoe should match the hose or the hose the shoe. Um, they're not as rigid with women's colors. Women have more liberty, I think, in colors because they haven't been in the marketplace that long for the subconscious to get fixed. But we do know there shouldn't be any fluffy sleeves. Oh, all sleeves should cover at least the elbow. Three-quarter to full-length sleeve. A short sleeve is not appropriate. Uh, nail polish should be light, white, natural, uh, not reds, blacks, or the, some of the other more radical colors. Um, i trying to think. What are some of the other things that might come up for women? Uh, makeup is standard, hair is standard. Um, I'm sure, a certain no low cut or high cut or oh, yeah. anything like that. Yeah. Nothing that's uh, sensuous at all. Nail polish is tricky. Mm -hmm. Even men and women both are distracted by it. They really don't like it. The, um, but I think uh, it's a matter of surrendering our personal feelings about it and saying, hey, what am I up to here? I'm up to communicating with people and persuading them, therefore I'm going to honor this. I gave up a lot of my attitudes about clothes and shoes and this kind of thing, and I just surrendered, and I've been glad that I did ever since. I know this, that we want to create a circumstance where when someone walks into a room, if everyone is dressed this way, okay, they're going to wonder who's in charge, mm -hmm. rather than knowing who is by the way they present themselves. And by the way, a lot of people kid about this. They think, oh, this is silly, and we should be able to you know, dress who we are and what have you. I remember IBM was accused of having monkey suits. M O N K E Y. Ever mm -hmm, hear of that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, they, they misspelled it. There's no K in that. <laughs> Those uh, are money suits. No money suits, exactly. Because they allow us to communicate effectively. See, that's what that's really all about. Um, but very quickly, we've reviewed time, consciousness, integrity, adoptability, presentations. And uh, we're going to go on next week and get into some of the really fascinating areas. There's some more criteria, and the one that I want to really spend some time with is accountability. Because, like I say, the subconscious doesn't make a very good boss. People can call 1-800-661-3490, and the number will be at the end of the show in the credits. Uh, it's been Life Talk, and my name is Byrne. Moses. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, Byrne. We did it. <laughs>